If you or someone you know is struggling with alcoholism or addiction, do not hesitate to reach out for help. You can find numerous free resources on our website, thebeginagainpodcast.com, and there are tons of resources and support networks available online, in person, or just a phone call away. You don't have to face this challenge alone. Welcome to the Begin Again Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Menkes. On the Begin Again Podcast, we delve into the inspiring journeys of individuals who have overcome alcoholism and addiction and emerged as true trailblazers in entrepreneurship, business, sports, and beyond. Through authentic, uplifting, and profound conversations with our guests, we aim to shatter the stigma surrounding addiction and demonstrate that recovery can be a catalyst for remarkable success, strength, and resilience. We firmly believe that by listening to these accounts, you will be empowered to unlock your own potential, instigate positive change in your life, and contribute to the creation of a better world. So, get ready to be inspired and embark on your own personal journey of growth with the Begin Again Podcast. Welcome back to the Begin Again podcast. I'm your host, Gary Menkes, and today I am really looking forward to this one. We have Shane Raymer. Shane is a speaker and coach who created that Sober Guy podcast in 2014 to help men quit drinking and become better fathers, husbands, entrepreneurs, and leaders. That Sober Guy has brought awareness and support to over 2.5 million listeners across the world. As a father of two kids and married to his wife of 20 years, Shane is passionate about following God, loving his family, and helping each and every person become purposeful leaders in their business, homes, and communities. And for more information, we're going to hear it again. You can find him at www.thatsoberguy.com. Shane, thanks for coming. How are you doing, bud? Gary, thanks, man. Thanks for having me, man. That's uh that bio and intro makes me sound um, so much more professional than I really am. So I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's good. Yeah. Th- hey, th- and thanks for, you know, thanks for the work you're doing too, man. This is awesome. And I appreciate you inviting me uh, on the podcast today and um, just to hang out and chat a little bit and, and hopefully uh, someone out there listening uh, uh, relates to something we say and, and it helps them out there. So that's oh, the goal. Yeah. That's the goal, right? That's the idea. And let me tell you, it's a pleasure to be, you know, shoulder to shoulder with you, even though you're way ahead of me and I'm looking up to you in this podcast world, but it's a pleasure to be on the same team here. And, you know, like I said, off camera, you know, podcasting, it wasn't even on my radar. And, you know, now here we are, it's a higher purpose than me really quick, but uh, I want to hear what you got here. How you, where'd you grow up, Shane? Yeah. So I'm, I'm from uh, Northern California, born and raised uh, Solano County. I was born in Vallejo, California. And then, and then we moved, uh, lived in Napa, Fairfield, and then ended up in a town called Vacaville, uh, which is right in the middle between Sacramento and San Francisco. Um, I've moved a couple of times. We, we spent some time down in Southern California at a couple of different points in my life in, in the Sacramento area. But uh, the majority of time, um, you know, has been, has been spent right here in Vacaville. Uh, with you know, got a lot of friends and family here. It's definitely a good a good spot. So yeah, it's uh, you know, and I'll just say I'll just say too, like as I've kind of grown in this, and as I continue to grow, and you know, I I, I heard this a long time ago in a meeting, and there was a guy uh, uh, Keith, I can't remember his last name, but he said you know he was like thir- thirty years you know without drugs, without alcohol, it changed his his life, the dynamic of his family's future, mm. and he just said, man, I, I'm in process. And the day I stop being in process is the day that I might as well just die because what's the point at that? And so I say that because, you know, I don't have everything figured out. I'm definitely not perfect. You know, as a parent, as a husband, I do dumb stuff sometimes. Still, <laughs> Like, I mean, compared to what I used to do now, it's, it's gotten a, a heck of a lot better, no doubt, but I'm learning, man. And I want to continue to learn and grow and get better as a man, as, as a husband, as a dad, as a friend and and all of the above. Um, and I just, my main purpose is to show people and let people know through my experience and, um, you know, through, through some of my story that, um, number one, uh, God loves you. And number two, um, he has an amazing plan for your life, but you got to open that door and you got to crack that door. And that's something that I experienced firsthand. Um, in the fact of I was making a lot of bad decisions. I was um, using drugs and alcohol to deal with life. I, I just, I didn't have a lot of tools to know how to deal with the day-to-day stuff. I had a young 
daughter at the time, you know, this was back in uh, 20, 2012, 2013 time. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of taking us back to the very end, right before I actually got, you know, went to rehab and got sober, you know, I was just confused, lost. It was, um, it was a, a dark place. I couldn't kick drinking. I'd tried many times before. Um, and I finally realized that I, I couldn't do it on my own. Um, and, you know, with all that, I felt in my gut uh, two things that God had something more for my life and not for just for my life, but for my daughter's life, for my, for my wife's life, for our family's life. And eventually, you know, I had a son just about a year after I got sober. And I also felt that something really bad was about to happen if I didn't make some changes Mm -hmm. Uh, because I had very, uh, you had a lot of close calls. I had a lot of, um, you know, quite a few friends who had either died or had gotten, you know, either incarcerated or had ended up um, in like one of my friends got in a really bad car accident and almost, almost died. He was in a coma for 52 days. It changed the whole course of his life, you know, brain, brain damage and um, body damage and just the whole thing. And I still didn't quit right after even that happened. I, I think it wasn't until about six months later that I had finally, you know, kind of, kind of broken down and, and given up. But the hardest thing was letting go. There's a lot of fear involved. There's a lot of fear involved in what are people going to think? What are people going to say? How am I going to do this? How am I going to live life without the crutch of alcohol? It's such a normal thing for us in a society. It's plastered all over the place. You go to a game, you go to um, a movie theater, they sell beer now. <laughs> I mean, wherever you go, there's a, the grocery store everywhere. Alcohol is all around us. And the perception of it is that you can drink responsibly and what it, well, you know, I, For me, I couldn't really do that. And um, I know there's plenty of people out there who can have a beer and, um, you know, I I don't have anything against necessarily. It's funny, like I almost said something and then I was contradicting it as I was saying, it's like, I don't have anything because that's kind of the go-to line that, and I've said it before. And the more I've thought about it, grown on it, and what I was going to say was, I don't have anything against alcohol, you know, but, but the more, because I I don't want to portray that, like I'm blaming the alcohol, I guess that's why I've always said that. But the more that I've gone on and the more that I've seen alcohol destroy people's lives, including those of people very close to me that I love and that are actively destroying it right now as we speak, it really pisses me off. And I'm kind of like over it. I'm, I'm kind of like, excuse my language. I'm just kind of like, fuck alcohol. Like in all these companies that are making millions and billions of dollars on um, advertising and making this no- this normal this normalcy bias that, yeah, you're just, you know, when you're with your buddies, you drink. And when you come home from work, you worked hard and you drink. And like, man, there's, there's, why? Like, why do we need to do that? <laughs> like, why? Like, what's the point? You know, go ahead, man. Sorry. No, I'd love no, to hear exactly your right. thoughts on that. I, I'm loving it. You know, it's funny you say that because I, like I said, I've been sober 17 plus years, May, May 13, 2006, my sobriety date. But, you know, it took me a long time. I'm at a point now too. I can't stand alcohol. I, I, I hate yeah. it. And I had a love affair with it. I had, I had an absolute love affair with alcohol. I, I loved it. And then when I didn't love it, I still kept drinking. And that's when it got really, really dark. But you said so many things in, 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 that, in that span. You know, you talked about the very beginning, being a grown man where you are right now, and you still want to learn and you still want to grow. And I didn't, I'm in the same spot. I'm, I, I'm love to learn. I love to grow, but I, I wasn't thinking that way 17 plus years ago. That, that, yeah. that wasn't, that wasn't the mindset. And you mentioned also, you know, the destruction that alcohol does to people, you know, what mm-hmm. about the families it destroys? It just, it, forget about, you know, the, the, uh, the repercussions of everyone around that person. And there's like, there's zero or 0.1 degrees of separation with, with drugs yeah. and alcohol. You know, that's just, that's just a fact of life. If it's not you, that's affected a very good chance that someone very close to you, you know, someone very close, oh, yeah. to you, you know? And yeah. So- how, well, how, how many times have you met somebody and, you know, you tell them that you're sober or you tell them maybe oh, I have a podcast or, or whatever. And they go, oh, man, no way. You know, hey, my, my sister really struggles or, or my my son or, you know, my a friend of mine is in rehab right now. Almost every single time it comes up, Absolutely. there's somebody affected by it. To your point, you know, it's yeah. true. No, it's funny you say that right before I kind of launched my podcast, I was at a conference and it was the first time I said, when I go to this conference, it was like an e-commerce, like entrepreneur, I don't have an e-commerce business or anything like that. But I said, go there. All I'm going to talk about is this upcoming podcast. And to your point, 
everyone I mentioned it to is, oh man, really? Wow. You know, my husband's here. Can you go talk to him? And I did. I had to talk with her, yeah. his husband. This other guy, my girlfriend, she's struggling. She just went to rehab and, uh, you know, my sister, yeah. I mean, across the board. And that's everyone. Was, yeah. I was there for three days and I was texting my wife the whole time. I was like, man, this is going to be good because even the, the people that aren't afflicted by it, it's there's people really close to them. And now, you know, you get those gifts too. And you're a sober coach, but you get those gifts of people like, you know, reaching out to you, DM and DM and you, Hey man, yeah, love what you just did on your podcast. You helped me today. Or, you know, to, to the same point of the woman, like, can you, here's my, can you please call my husband? I'm, Absolutely. You know, and yeah. those, those yeah. Are, you know, nobody was calling Gary Shane, you know, 17 plus years ago for any kind of help <laughs> at all, you know, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, tell us and, how, uh, uh, tell us before, you know, before 2013, 2012, you just, you know, what was it like get, getting mm. leaning, you know, going into those years? What was it like for you growing up? You know, growing up was, you know, my, my mom and dad both had me when they, they both were high school, dropped out of high school, you know, 17, 16, 17. I think they had me. I think my mom may have been still 17 when they had me um, or vice versa. I don't know. They were young. Um, not not a whole lot of education. Um, in life, and when I say that, I just mean like life experience education as well. I mean, they're, they were just so young. And, um, you know, and the more that I've grown too, and, and like, you know, done, done the, the work and tried to understand, see my parents as human beings instead of just like mom and dad. And let me blame you for everything because, you know, all my problems are your fault. Like that victim mentality that, that was, I mean, that, that destroyed me for a lot of years. And I think that was a big piece of, of my drinking career. And the, the way that I was living my life was that victim mentality. And it's a terrible way to live. And, uh, um, you know, for, for my parents, I came to realize that, you know, number one, like I said, they're human beings and they, they had their own lives before they had me and my sister. Um, but they also had their own trauma. You know, my, my mom was adopted um, when, when she was a baby and she, you know, she found out in her early teens, I think that she was adopted. And so, you know, just in speaking with her and then, you know, speaking with other people, my uncle, her brother is also adopted too. You know, there's something there that, um, even if it's not maybe traumatic is, is not the right word for that specific situation, but it definitely is something that is um, very difficult for a lot of people to deal with um, in, in their life. Oh, sorry, man. I forgot to turn my phone off here. Um, and so, you know, my, my mom had that, um, you know, and then, and then my dad, you know, he lost his sister, Wendy, when he was 15 and she was seven. And, um, you know, one of the last things that he said to her was that he hated her. You know, she fell off a horse and, and hit her head on a rock and um, and died. And so, you know, between these two things and then compile, like having a new baby, you know, I was born in, in 81. Like I said, they, they were just they were so young. Um, that led to just a life of you know, there, there was a lot of financial struggle. Um, alcohol was a main, um, you know, was a main coping device for my dad. And you got to remember too, this is in the eighties. So, I mean, <laughs> cocaine was big out cores was big, like, you know, alcohol, uh, drugs and alcohol. It was just, it was different. And it was a big part of my childhood really, you know? And so that led to a lot of, uh, domestic disputes. I always con called it controlled chaos because my dad was always in control of everything, or at least he appeared to be. Um, but there was just a lot of immaturity and um, a lot of stress. Um, now with that, and because I always tend to go to the bad side, we did have some good times, man. And I was just updating. I'm, I'm, I just started writing a book actually. And I was updating some of the articles that I'm kind of using to, to kind of outline some of this. And, um, I don't always want to just focus on, on the hard times because there were some good times. Like there were some camping trips and trips to Lake Tahoe and, you know, we'd go skiing and go to some concerts and stuff. Um, and so you did have those times, but I think the, the most confusing thing for a kid, and I'll just say, let's say I'm uh, 12 years old at this time. Like that, that seems to be a, a pretty significant time for me as a kid when I remember back, because I just remember feeling like, um, angry. Um, obviously I loved my parents, but I didn't, but I, I had a lot of animosity towards my father, um, you know, at the time. And, uh, and I didn't know how to get a lot of that out. Um, and I just had developed a, like a, a way to just escape by just being out of the house. So I was out skating, I was out BMXing or, you know, playing in the neighborhood, 
hanging out. Um, and, and over time, even though I had kind of promised that I was never going to drink or, or, you know, do drugs or anything. Cause I had seen what it was doing. I eventually, you know, I played baseball, always had a love for music and a love for baseball still do till this day. You know, I'd always played baseball at, at that time. And then as I kind of got into my teens, that's, that's kind of when the drinking started, you know, um, and smoking weed and it wasn't anything like too, too crazy when I was younger, it was just, you know, you kind of did it on the weekends and, um, you know, high school playing baseball, you're kind of, you know, just being dumb. And, but that progressed, man, it definitely progressed. And over time between trying to like work and then take care of myself. And then my wife and I got together when I was 20, 21, I think we have known each other since the sixth grade, by the way, too. So it's kind of, it's kind of awesome. Yeah. just like, we were friends before anything, man, it just, God, it's so hard to like tell your story sometimes. Too. <laughs> I mean, like the detail, I, cause that as I'm telling it, there's so, and every time you tell it, it's a little bit different because there's things that my mind is just like, boom, boom, boom. There's so much stuff. Yeah. Like the, the music part of stuff, um, you know, the, the baseball side, and I touched a little bit on those, but at the end of the day, I think what it comes down to is my parents did the best they could. Um, with what the, with the tools that they had, which which weren't a lot, um, and uh, I did have some supportive family members out, you know, like grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and stuff, who kind of saw what was going on, who tried to always be there for me and stuff. And uh, I started drinking, and I'm I'm kind of a pedal to the metal guy, so it was like all or none, and um, it it went downhill really fast. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah you, we could be like brothers here i mean same thing baseball i love baseball i played baseball <laughs> my whole life you know and i still to this day i still daydream when i'm watching a ball game like man i wish i was yeah there right now. oh you, man i know but you talk about so much and, and and really struck nerve with me was you know you talk about your parents and for me you know i had i had an active dad right and i and i hated as a young age i hated cocaine my whole life growing like mm. i hated it because i would see it when i was eight nine ten years old like all over the all the time and so I started developing this chip on my shoulder. I think that's kind of what made yeah. me get in the bat. And, and I and as I got a little older, I started drinking and stuff like that really would come out. And I had this kind of, you know, this anger yeah. maybe, or it would come out. I'd be the happiest guy or I'd be the nastiest guy or I'd be the happiest guy on a drop of a dime. I'd be the nastiest guy in the place and you would know it. Yeah. Way, you know, and then yep. it wasn't until I got sober in recovery that I started looking at me because I held on to this thing my whole life in my back pocket. I had this in my back pocket. Like if you saw the shit I saw when I was a kid, then you would yeah, be worse than like me. An excuse. Yeah. yeah, all the justification. <clears throat> and, and 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 like you, yeah, my my mom and dad have their own stuff too, you know. And uh yeah. you know, my dad never got sober, but we we have a very good relationship with with both of them at, the, at this stage. It's been it's been a lot of ups and downs, yeah. a lot of stories in there involved, but you know, they did the best they could as well. You know, I never wanted to look at me again. This isn't stuff that we look, we, you know, we didn't grow up looking at, at ourselves in the mirror, you know, it's all what happened to yeah. me, you know, and then you get in recovery and it's like, well, what, what's your part? Yeah. Know? And that's it's hard like, to recognize sometimes too, because especially if you've played that victim role or that just justifying the behavior for so long, you brought up a good point, like in there too, about doing that work and stuff on your parents, because that's so huge. Like, at least I know how huge that was for me. It comes back to forgiveness and it comes back to forgiveness of, you know, the people who hurt you or you don't think that, you know, you should have grown up like that or, you know, this certain incident or, and obviously these situations can, can be, you know, extremely severe. We're talking about abuse and stuff all mm -hmm. the way up to just verbal stuff or, a, a, you know, a negative environment or a situation. So I, you know, I know the severity of each situation can be different, but at the end of the day, I think forgiveness is the answer for that. Mm. Um, and that's something that is extremely difficult for us as human beings to do. Like forgiveness is, I think we, a lot of us just naturally, we tend to take that mentality. Um, and I know I did. It was like, if you screw me over or you do something to me, it's like, you're done. Like, screw you. Like I I'm done with you. And you're lucky I don't, whoop your ass or whatever, you know, like, like that kind of mentality, like written off, whatever. But all that does, I notice is just create more angst, more anxiety, more negativity. Um, and I'm not saying that we jump right in and we're like, Hey, I forgive you right away. A lot of the time it takes years, you know, it takes work. Mm. Um, and I've had to do a lot of that, like with my, with my own, my own dad specifically, 
um, you know, and just understanding that like he's his own dude and he's li- he has his choice, you know, he or he made his choices to go down the path that he's on today. And whether I agree with that or not, you know, and I've shared this is a this is a good one I'll share. I've shared it many times on the podcast, but it's probably it's probably one of my favorite stories. You know, I was talking to my sponsor one day, this is a few years back, and uh, I was uh, I was complaining about all the things that my father had never did for me. You know, he never did this and that, and he's he's a piece of shit, and you know whatever. And fi- and finally, my sponsor he said, uh, uh, his name's Buddy Buddy C, man, awesome dude. He goes. Uh, I'm, I've been I've been so trying to stop cussing, by the way, too. But I'm just gonna say it because this is what okay. he said. He said, "Would you shut the fuck up?" And I, I was like, "Whoa!" Because he never talks to me like that. Like he never he never did that. He goes, "You're complaining and sitting here bitching about all the things your dad didn't do for you. You set expectations that he will never meet, and that's your fault." And mm-hmm. I was like, "Whoa!" Like, all right. And so I kind of like a light bulb in that moment. Like, wait. I'm actually like, like you said, what's our part in this? Like, so my part in this is that I'm walking around blaming him for all this stuff that yeah, it happened. I'm not excusing some of the things, but like, I mean, that's my bad. You know, I have to learn to forgive. I have to learn to understand and let go of some of that stuff. Not, not for him, you know, but for me. And so, so that's been huge in developing um, like tools to deal with other stuff in life too. I mean, just being a dad, trying to stay calm. Like I, I lost my, my son. We were going to baseball practice yesterday and he couldn't get his shoes on. And it, like I said, it's super hot here right now. And like we were late and I was sweating and I was like trying to help him get his shoes on. And he was getting upset and I was getting upset. And like, I lost my shit. And I was just like, I like threw the shoe down and like, I look like a big baby. Look like a big baby. And then he got mad and he told, you know, he said, I can't, we, he, he, and then I had to stop for a second and go, dude, like Shane, what are you doing? Yeah. This is almost 10 years sober. Like it's not alcohol. It's me. You know what I mean? It's my, it's, and, and so, but it was a great opportunity. Uh, you know, after a couple of minutes, he went out back and I took a couple breaths. It was a great opportunity to go out and say, Hey buddy, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like I'm not perfect. I'm, um, I want to be the best dad possible, but I mess up sometimes just mm-hmm. like anybody else. And I'm sorry. And I love you so much. And I'm so sorry. I got so upset right there. Yeah. Um, let's get your shoes on and, and let's go. Let, let's, let's figure this out. All I had to do was undo the top shoe as a pair of Jordans are super hard to get on. I had to undo the top lace in there and open it up a little bit, but instead I was in a hurry. And so it's just things like that, I guess, like that, you know, I've kind of learned that even when I mess up, like I can, like take a second and step back and recognize like how I'm feeling and then like pause for a minute. We talk about a lot in recovery, just pausing and and taking a second, sit in the feelings we're having, even if I'm angry or upset and saying, okay, like consciously, man, I'm really upset right now. I really feel frustrated right now. Let me take a breath, you know, because before it would escalate to God knows what. Right. You know, it, because it snowballs from there. And it usually is over something stupid. I'm a little all over the place, man. I'm enjoying this chat though. And so I hope that, you know, this, I hope someone out there listening is, um, you know, relating to some, some of this stuff. Well, there's one person relating. That's me. I'm really <laughs> good. Know, it's stuff. One thing that's, I that's ask awesome. for all the time is patience, you know, and I've had the same exact yes. situation with the same exact cleats uh, with my son <laughs> baseball too, man. Like, really, one thing I'm constantly I'm asking my higher powers, you know, please, please give me more patience, you know, because Amen I get to that. rattled when I when I when I do lose my my patience and I do get upset, you know, it rattles, yeah. me, you know, and I do and I say sorry, but you know, sometimes for a few days, like I can't get past, you know. How oh I, yeah, totally. You know, it's something just losing losing your temper quickly, and it's and for me, I just you know. I try to improve it, but what you're talking about, uh, just backing up a little bit also is what you're talking about. Um, it was an epiphany that was told to me as well. You know, I had these, you know, I had this chip on my shoulder. I had this stuff in my back pocket my whole life that, you know, uh, like I was mentioning, and it was brought to my attention that these deep resentments that we carry with ourselves, whatever they are, whatever may have happened to us, the unfortunate thing for us is the only person that is being affected, the only person that's being hurt right now by these resentments is me. So it's yeah. up to me. Yep. You know, like I can keep holding on to these things and it's gonna fuck everything else up and it's gonna I'm gonna, yeah. it's gonna affect my entire life and everyone around me, 
Or like you said, I can come to terms with it. I can have acceptance on it and I can have some forgiveness on it. And I mentioned yeah. earlier, I was, you know, I'm 17 plus years sober. Right. And I had, I finally, uh, I guess two years ago, did a full amends to my dad. And this is, mm-hmm. this is someone that my whole life, I said, you know, I don't, oh, I don't owe him, uh, you know, an amends, you know, he owes me an amends, you know, but you look at yeah. it and you look at, you know, there was times I acted out, you know, and I, and I justified my whole, my whole life, you know, like, well, like I said earlier, if, you know, if this happened to you, you would act this way, but there was times in those years, you know, I called him out one night, you know, that wasn't him. That was me. Yeah. So a few years ago, he was alone at the, at the house too. And I went in and I said, I got to talk to you. And I never talked to him like this my whole life. And I really quickly, immediately started bawling, crying. And I told him yeah. I was sorry for all those times. And, you know, I'm sorry for what I did yeah. that night at the ball field when I, you know, I called you out and, uh, and, you know, he was emotional too. And he's like, it's yeah. all right, you know, and I made those amends and I had that moment uh, with him. And since then, even though everything, nothing's changed, right? But, but our connection has been better since different. that day, you know, and That's awesome. it's part of the steps, right? That's why you got to go through them. It took me a long time. I'm a <laughs> yeah. stubborn, stubborn alcoholic, Shane, right? So it took me a while, <laughs> but hey, I'm yeah. still here and I'm going to keep coming back. So, yeah. you you know, I'm getting a good, good look at where you are going up. So let's talk about now. Where are you? I think you said around 2012, 2013, you start looking at recovery, right? Yeah, I had, um, you know, I had, I had tried to like, quit drinking or quit smoking off and on in the prior years to that, like in my, in my late twenties, um, probably is when it started. I, you know, at that time I was, I was a drywall finisher by trade. So I was out of local three, seven, six out of Vallejo. And, uh, I was doing a lot of work in the city. I worked with a few buddies of mine, um, that I'd grown up with long commutes, long days working hard labor work, you know, a lot, some days like, hustling and and that was really when i look back now it was really good for me honestly like it, it really did teach me a lot about um you know showing up even though there were days i didn't show up because i was hung over but <laughs> i was uh you know for the most part i think i tried to uh you know to really take some responsibility and obviously i, I had a young family at the time so i was trying to uh, make money so i had tried to quit and i could never do it i could never do it on my own i would last a couple of weeks and then i'd fall off and, and, and you know at this time my dad it, I had, there was just an issue with the way that he was kind of living through me with baseball and it made me very resentful and plus, and, and I got hurt at the time. I've hurt my shoulder. And and so I, I said, I'm done. I'm done with baseball. Basically. I didn't end up following through at, at uh, college here. And I started going down a path um, of picking up music again. And so I started being in some different bands. And when you, are in bands at that age for me i thought the epitome of being in a band was like doing crazy stuff and partying and like you know that whole lifestyle was cool um and so that's kind of what i was doing at that time as well as working like in construction you know so i was going to work and then with that came the alcohol and and all that it's a really like confusing time like and i think i just didn't have a lot of cares about stuff at that time too you know, I loved my wife, obviously. I just didn't really care about much. Like, to be honest, like I, I just, I didn't, I wasn't like suicidal or anything, but I would do stupid stuff like driving, like to where I just didn't care. Like if I crashed or um, I drank and drive a lot, you know, I was high a lot. Um, and I was also trying to record music and like, I was gonna, you know, I wanted to make that a career full time. And by that time in like my late twenties, after we did have my daughter, like, you know, here I am having a two-year-old, a two-year-old daughter. By this time I had gotten out of construction and I was working um, for a major utility out here in California in the mail room. I was making like 14 bucks an hour. I went from making like almost 40 bucks an hour down to like 14 bucks an hour Mm -hmm. because I just didn't want to do drywall anymore. I saw what it was doing to a lot of the older guys in that profession. And they were just, a lot of them were bitter and um, their bodies were broken down I had the sense to see like, I, you know, you know what, just, I don't think this is for me. The money's great. I need to figure something else out or I'm going to get trapped in this basically forever. Mm-hmm. I'm going to keep drinking. It was a cycle. You know, after I got out of that back working in the mail room, man, I was just like pissed off and like, I just didn't care about much. You know, I, I just didn't feel like I had a lot to live for. And it was crazy because like here, like I have this like beautiful daughter you know, this baby, she's so sweet. And like, I love her so much. And my, my wife is great. You know, we're, we're best friends, 
but like I was just kind of blinded to that by just my own insecurities and lack of confidence and victim mentality and anger and all that stuff. And the only tool that worked was alcohol. That was the only thing that worked to deal with that because I didn't have to feel. And so I always say like, I, yes, I have a problem with alcohol, you know, but I more have a problem with feeling like I didn't know how to feel. And that's why I drink because I, I and I still struggle with that. till this day, like you put a, I don't like watching sad movies because I don't like to feel <laughs> my wife will be watching something. And I'm like, what are you watching? And it's like real intense and serious. And I'm like, yeah, that looks like a real feeling movie. I don't think I'm going to be watching that right now. <laughs> you know, I just, just don't, I, you know, and, and it's tough some days, you know, so that brought me up to a point though, of just, just desperation. I'll, I'll give you an average day right before I quit. Like, uh, um, it could be like a Wednesday. I was working a swing shift and I was driving to work in Sacramento, which is, it was West Sac's about a 40 minute drive from my house and uh, a little single cab Chevy uh, stick shift with no AC and a uh, hot summer day, you know, you're sweating and um, I'm leaving for work at like 11, you know, and um, I'm telling myself, I'm not going to stop at the liquor store today. I'm not going to stop today. I'm, I don't want to drink today. I really want to stop this. It's, it's killing me. Like, you know, and, and it's, I could feel it. You know, I could feel something bad was going to happen. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, but sure as heck, you know, I'm pulling off in Dixon and I'm hitting that store and I'm getting, you know, my, my daily go-to. And so continue on during, during the day I was drinking at work. I was drinking on my way home from work. I was drinking when I got home and doing other substances till two, three, four in the morning. Um, and it was like on repeat and every day was the same thing. I would wake up and, and feel guilty and terrible and shameful and say I was going to quit. And then by 11 o'clock, I'd be driving to work saying, I'm not going to do this again, pulling off at the same liquor store. So it was just like, it was like this repetitive cycle. And, uh, I think I just got to a point of pure desperation and pure, I was just exhausted from it. My wife really knew something was bad and something was off with me. She just didn't know the extent of it because I wasn't like a blackout drinker either. Like a lot of people were surprised when they found out that I had gone to rehab and like was trying to make some changes in my life because I was very good at masking and maintaining my reputation or my um, I, I could talk to people pretty normal and I wasn't the one falling in the gutter and being like stupid and it was, you know, pretty, pretty fun for the most part, depending on the environment. But in my head though, was like, the, man, it was crazy going on in my head. And I'm sure you can relate to that. You know, all of it. I say it a lot too. You know, you talked about t- talking to yourself, you know, I, that dawned on me later, you know, when forget, I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, the only difference yeah. between you and I is everyone around me knew I had a problem. You know, everyone, yeah. knew I had a, I, there's something wrong with this guy. You know, my girlfriend mm-hmm. at the time, who's now my wife, you know, I cunning and baffling and powerful, as they say, like Man. I had the baffling part, like so down pat. It was like, I just baffled <laughs> everyone around me, myself included, you know, and then when yeah. it gets dark, that's when it gets really cunning and you can't stop anymore. But I would stare yeah. at my computer and I would tell myself all day, I'm not drinking tonight. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. All day long. And then 12 o'clock, you feel a little bit better, but I'm still not going to drink tonight. And then five o'clock, I go out and I go out all night and maybe I don't make it in the next day. And that's how I was. And, you know, you take away all my my rap sheet and all the trouble that I've been in. uh, You you forget to throw that all out. Just talk about that little moment where, you know, a young guy in his young 20s talking to himself all day about not drinking and he actually can't stop and he's still doing it. (laughs) And then goes out all night, you know, yep. and the mask doesn't even come home. And then I would, and I, then I also pull Irish exits. Like I'd go out with a bunch of dudes or friends and that's, and boom, I just say, you know, they're not, they're, these are, these, I need to go find them. I want to be by myself. I became a real isolator, but you talked yeah. about so much stuff so, too yeah. before that about, you know, the victim mentality and what you were describing. Also, um, I think all of us in our community do, you know, we feel less than we have low self-esteem yeah. and maybe we, maybe we mask it, but inside we are really, really struggling. And, and so yeah. I love that. No one knew that you kept it up, but in the inside you had, you called it controlled chaos. I imagine there's a lot of chaos going in, in your mind at this time. So, but you're starting to, yeah, you're really talking to yourself, right? You're obviously got some self-awareness that something needs to change. How does it change? What happens? Yeah, I just, I think I woke up one day and I just realized I was becoming everything that I never wanted to be. Like Mm -hmm. literally, like I was not the father that I wanted to be. 
I was not the husband that I wanted to be. I just felt, you know, just the confidence level was so low. And and like I, you know, I, I've said it a couple of times already, but I knew in my gut that God had something more for, for my life. You know, and I mentioned, my, you know, friends had been in accidents. I, I couldn't stop drinking at work. I had tried to stop so many times on my own um, and I couldn't do it. I, and, and I finally had to just face the fact that like, hey, I need some help here. And I don't really have many other options at this point, you know, and um, luckily for me, my buddy Seth, um, you know, he's, he's a, we've known each other since fifth grade, I think. Um, And he had, he had quit drinking about two years before I did. And so I always had that in the back of my mind, like, damn, if if Seth, he was a different drinker than me and he'll, he'll, he's been on the podcast a bunch of times too. Um, and shared his story and stuff. He was in the Coast Guard and he he dealt in 9-11. He was in Staten Island when that happened. And so he was helping to, you know, pull victims out. And so he had a lot of stuff that he had to deal with. And um, so and and alcohol was his best friend through all that, just being a coasty and like to that's what they did. And so I knew how he drank, you know, I knew what he went through. And I and I remember telling myself, man, if Seth can do this, I can do this too. And so I, I had that, I had that moment of like, man, I, I, if I go all in, I can, I think I can, I can do this. But I was just, you know, I was so scared and hesitant. And I didn't want to go away to rehab for 30 days and what's everyone going to think about me. And, you know, but ultimately um, I, I took my wife one day, I just finally had enough. I was depleted. And I said, Hey, can you meet me over at the little restaurant that we would usually go drink at? That was another thing too, just real, real quick is that, you know, my wife and I were best friends since we were, in, you know, or, or we were friends since we were in the sixth grade, you know, but, um, and I always had a crush on her, but like, we didn't know how to, and she, par- she partied with me too, a lot in our twenties, um, you know, but she didn't party like I did. Like she could stop, you know, and she had her, her moments and stuff, of course, too. But like, it wasn't, it wasn't the same for her as it was for me, but like, we didn't even know each other. We didn't even know how to like conversate without alcohol or substances. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't even know how to have a date night without that involved. And so, um, like when, when I took her to, when I had her meet me at the restaurant that night, you know, I had, I made sure I had like the strongest drink possible and I downed that thing. And I just, I just flat out told her like, I can't do this anymore. You know, like I, I need some help. You know, I think I have a a really big problem with alcohol. I'm drinking at work. I can't stop. My mind is go is racing. It's going crazy. And I just, I I need some help, you know, and um, that's kind of how it went down. And then I think right after that, either that evening or the next morning, I met with Seth and I told him, he already knew, he had already taken me to a couple of meetings like a year prior. And I I remember sitting in one of those meetings and going, I'm not like these people. (laughs) How many times have we heard so many of us say that, you know, I'm I'm way, like, come on, you know, and he already knew that I had an issue and he knew my family history and stuff too. Our parents used to party together back in the day. We used to steal beers. We were in like fifth, sixth grade. Our parents would be partying out in the backyard and me, him, and uh, me, Seth, Chad, a couple other buddies, we'd be in the back room in the bedroom stealing beers from the cooler, cracking them and downing them in the room. So, you know, he, he knew what was up just as well yeah. as his own issues. But here's probably the favorite part of, of my of my story on this part, Gary, is so I, I let the cats out of the bag, right? Seth knows, my wife knows, I need to go to rehab. I, I How are we going to do this? And so the next morning, I wake up and my mind's going crazy and it's going, man, don't be a little bitch. Like you got this. Like you don't have a problem. You're not as bad as this guy. and You can handle this. All those same thoughts that have been really preventing me from going. The only difference was now is that I couldn't lie about it and hide it anymore because my wife and my best friend knew and they knew that I needed some help. So I was like, dude, I, so I took, I grabbed my dog and I was like, I got to go on a walk right now. Cause I was supposed to be calling the place, you know, to get some help that day. And, uh, I'm walking down the road and it's a busy parkway. It's actually right by where we live now. It was eerily quiet that day. There's usually cars racing up and down. It was just a, just weird. And I'm walking up and I see this book in the middle of the road and I'm like, man, and I start to get closer and I notice it's a Bible laying in the middle of the road. Right. I didn't mention this earlier, but it is a big part of my story. I, I was raised Catholic catechism. I always known Jesus. I've always known God. 
but I really fell away from from him as I got older. And I never understood the difference between a relationship with God and religion. Those are two totally different separate things. And that's a whole, probably another conversation that we could pair up on forever. Um, but I had fallen away from that. And as I walked closer though, I walked, I said, man, that, that is a Bible. And I, and I kept walking and I remember feeling a lot of emotion at that time. And I felt like just the enemy was just doing work in my brain. And I got about 10, 15 feet past it. And I just heard like, stop and go pick it up. So I, I stopped and I turned around and, and I went and I, when I went down to get it, you know, um, I just, I just felt and heard like, go, go get help. I got you. Like you're doing the right thing. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was this overwhelm. And I, I started to weep and I was just like, I, I had, that was like my first, um, I get chills even talking about it right now. Like that was my first spiritual awakening and moment that I had had in, um, in a long, long, long time. And so I knew it was going to be tough. I knew it was going to be difficult. I knew there was a long road ahead, but at that moment, I had no doubt in my mind that I was making the right decision. And so I turned around and I went straight home and I got on the phone. And I think within a day, I was at the same place in Sebastopol, California, which is out by uh, Santa Rosa. Um, I was in the same place called Azure Acres that my buddy Seth was in two years prior. And man, that 30 days was crazy and it was hard. And you know, it was hard to be away from my family. We had a lot of help from from family to pay bills while I was in there. Thank God for that, you know, and, and to get through that. But the more difficult time was coming home and trying to reacclimate now, like I'm supposed to be this new person and like, I don't drink anymore. Like I mentioned with my wife, we didn't know how to conversate like that. So it's, it's been a long road of like rebuilding and, and getting to know myself and getting to know, you know, my wife as a per, and you know, we're, we're, we're great now. And, you know, we, we still bicker like anyone would, of course, but like, you know, cause we know each other better, but like it took a good year, if not longer to get reacclimated where we could go out to dinner and like conversate without alcohol, you know, and she stopped drinking too. She, she stopped drinking for a while. She'll still have a glass of wine here and there now. Um, but for the first couple of years, like she just, and, cause she didn't want to anymore. She was tired of it too, you know, and, and she wanted to support me as well. But it took some time to start rebuilding that relationship um, and our marriage to, you know, really understand each other. And and so we could continue to grow, you know. It's amazing yeah. walking down. I mean, it's amazing, right? I, there's just no coincidences. We hear it all the time. You know, you're walking down. Absolutely. You need to go take a walk. You're at really low point, right? You're You're struggling internally for sure. You know, maybe yeah. you, think you overshot some of these things about not drinking, but you opened up yourself a little bit to your wife and your buddy and you go for a walk. Yeah. In the Bible in the middle of the street and you're passing by. Let me, uh, I have it right here. That's it. Oh, look at that. wow. Look at the holy cow. Yeah. Unbelievable. It wasn't, yeah, it's not a big Bible, but it was, uh, wow. yeah, it's pretty crazy, man. So I still have it. Um, it's, that's incredible. Yeah, it's very sentimental. Yeah. You got hold, you're hold on to <laughs> yeah. that. Forever for sure. Crazy, man. Yeah. Unbelievable. So you're, you know, you get spoken to. Your higher power speaks to you, reaches out and says, I got mm -hmm. you. Right. And I, I I was born a Catholic too. I wasn't very religious at all growing up, but I didn't find God till I got sober. And I told yeah. you how, how stubborn I am, right? It took me a long time even to realize that there's a a very strong higher power God component to all this. But you know, I did and I yep. found him. And this podcast, we mentioned this, I believe at the beginning or off camera, like this podcast is, you know, it's already bigger than me. You know, there's some, there's a higher purpose here and it's, uh, it's yep. a beautiful thing. It's great. And I get to meet people like you, but uh, you also mentioned your buddy who was in the Coast Guard. I was, I was a half, half a mile North of, of World Trade Center when it went down to 9-11. Really? So oh, yeah, wow. yeah. You know, I started right downtown in Manhattan of, uh, when did I start? February of, of 01. Uh, September that happens, and a few months later, April of twenty twenty, uh, April of twenty of, of April, the a few months later, I'm in my first rehab of uh, of two thousand two, yeah. and so I go to rehab in two thousand two. My sobriety date's not till two thousand six, so I'm in and out for four years, and I'm battling yeah. it. I'm in it, and it's dark. And but same thing, I don't know what happened to me. I can't really put a finger on it when I 
was given that gift to surrender. I didn't want to do it anymore. Like I said, everyone, uh, everyone around me knew that I had a problem. I knew I had a problem. I'm laughing too about, you know, the AA guys, you know, I was in AA, in AA for four years in and out. And I said, you know, I knew there was going to be a time I'm going to have to stop drinking one day, but I'm definitely not going back to AA. That's for sure. I'm not like those people. And <laughs> yeah. all, on May, uh, you know, May 12th, 2006, uh, I find myself calling New York City Intergroup AA and I'm at a meeting the very next day. And for the first time, yeah. I start doing what people are telling me to do. Like I used to have to do it my yeah. own way, you know, like I'd, I'd be the yeah. I, I'd walk in five minutes late. I'd sit in the back. I leave a little early this time. I sat in the front when some stranger said, give me your you know, you got to call me tomorrow. And every instinct in my body is to not call some strange dude. I was oh, like, yeah. I don't know weird. anything. Yeah, this is yeah, it goes against yeah. <laughs> but you know what? It's working for these guys. So all right, um, this yep. time I'm just gonna do what I'm told. And I did what I was told, you know, I'm still doing what yeah. I'm told, you know, and uh my life was changed. And so your life was changed too. You go out and you said you have this 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 transition period about a year. I had something similar with my buddies. I feel like there's this big chunk of time that like, I just kind of, I miss from like my boys. I just couldn't, you know, yeah. I thought I was going to lose them all. In fact, I was on one of your uh, Instagrams, I think today, and I actually commented on it and it was like, you know, what, what is the uh, advice do you give like to the newcomer, you know, when they're, mm-hmm. when they're thinking this, you know, what, when they're thinking all the wrong things, like, I remember you mentioned it too. I remember thinking like, all right, my buddies are gone. All my best friends are probably not going to be able to have them anymore. Uh, people are going to think I'm weak. What are people going to think? Yeah. Of, you know, how am I going to further my career? And the truth is none of it is true. It's complete. All yeah. the lies that we tell ourselves, but it's what we think. And that's what the newcomer needs to hear. Right. So, yep. like, you know, you're not weak. You're strong, man. You know, and your oh, buddies, yeah. your buddies going to be your buddies. And if they have a problem with you not drinking, then they're not your buddies. It's pretty, pretty simple. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. That's a, you know, and that, yeah, that I really relate to that too, because that was a hard, um, a hard kind of pill to swallow at that time. Like, you know, what's everyone going to think? Like, am I still going to kick it, you know, and be able to hang with some of my friends? And, and I do, I still, I still have a lot of, um, of, uh, of the same friends that I had back then. And we don't see each other as, as much obviously as we used to, but like, and and some of them are still they're still they still drink you know then that's that's their thing but I I don't put myself in situations that I don't want to be in you know or that I that I shouldn't be in period and so um, but at first yeah there had to be some distance there and uh, for the most part everyone was pre- was pretty pretty supportive on my end which I which I think is awesome and and like you said the ones who aren't supportive they're they're not your buddies anyways and yeah. and I, I promise you you. you you see who your friends are really quick when you, when you give up alcohol, cause you got drinking buddies and then you got your real friends and Absolutely. you'll, you'll figure it out real yeah. fast. No, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I still got the same crew. We're in a chat. There's like, I don't know, 12 of us, same crew from, you know, some of them I went to it's kindergarten the first grade. Yeah. The best, best yeah. points. But I went through a time, uh, I guess probably like 10 years sober, probably getting close to where you are. And I, I, I had this thing. I was like, I wonder, I never really talked to them. You know, they talked, they helped me, they were supportive, but I never really like talked to them about, you know, when I went away, when I stopped drinking, yeah. I, was, I was really having a lot of doubt. And huh. I was like, I wonder what they think, you know, I wonder what they th- think. And I, and I think I was getting squirrely. I wasn't running a good program. Yeah. It came up, we were all out, we came out again yeah, and the topic came up and I was like, you know, I never asked you guys, you know, like, what did you ever, th- you know, what did you think when I, you know, when I went out, when I stopped drinking, when I went to rehab and they all looked around and they said, oh, we talked about this guy. We all think he would have been dead. You know, I was like, really? Mm. Like, yeah, we yeah. all think you would probably would have been dead. And every one of them said, yeah, amen to that. I was like, I'm going to keep coming wow. back. I'm going to stay in this program for a few days longer. But yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. you get those messages uh, sometimes. You know, Again, we, we're the last, I, I'll speak for myself. Sometimes I'm the last person to see it, right? You know, you make a little progress every totally. day. And you know, lo and behold, you put 365 days together and you made a lot of progress. And I was the last person to yep. see, it, you know, but I love oh, you. Yeah. So what you're saying, so you're, you know, you have that year, that transition, you know, and what year are we talking about? What year is this? 2013? Uh, let's see. Yeah. I, my sobriety date is September 11th, 2013. Nice, yep. nice day. Yeah, man. I know. Crazy. Yeah. September. Okay. Yep. So not sure. And was it April or not long after you start a yeah. podcast? How do you get into, you know, you're sober, you decide you're going to change your life and yeah. try sobriety because no one knows how long they, you know, no one knows what's going to yeah. happen right? when you, when you turn like, change your life around, but you go into, you start a podcast and now it's your livelihood. Tell us what happened. How yeah. Did you get there? 
So I go to rehab, I come home, I go back to work, back to the same job at first for, to the same job that I was having a really hard time at. Um, but eventually I, I was able to transfer into a different office out in Santa Rosa. You got to take Highway 37 past the uh, Sonoma Raceway. And it's it's a it's a long drive and there's a lot of traffic. And it was a, it was a terrible drive at the time. And I was still driving that little Chevy S10, um, you know, single cab with no AC. And so, uh, you know, I'm doing this drive every day. I'm, I'm literally commuting about four hours total. Um, but, you know, between there and back every day and I'm trying to stay sober, I'm trying to work a program. Um, and I'm starting to listen, I'm starting to listen to podcasts on my drive. Mm. And, um, and the the first podcast I listened to a buddy of mine, um, Justin sent to me and it was a podcast called the new man with this, with this guy, Trip Lanier. Um, and, and so I started listening to that and man, Tri- Trip's a great dude. It's, it's, it's crazy. Cause we had, we have eventually kind of became, you know, friends and I, I've been on his show and he's been on, on sober guy a couple of times. Um, but he was really a pivotal part of helping me to see that if I thought bigger and I thought outside of the box, mm-hmm. I could do something that um, would, would keep me sober and that would help other people and and that I could have fun doing because my music career at that point was done. And so there was a, there was a really um, a sad spot. And I think in my heart that like I had failed and that like, I, I didn't want to do music anymore because I equated it with drugs and alcohol. And like, I just couldn't vibe on it. It just, it just didn't feel like it fit in my life with, um, you know, a baby on the way. My, my wife was pregnant at this time with my son. I think at this point too, to paint the picture, like it wasn't all rainbows and butterflies. We were getting evicted from our house at this point uh, because we, we couldn't pay the rent. We were just really struggling financially at this point. Like it, it was, it was a tough time. I wasn't making a lot of money um, and uh, it, it was hard. And so I'm commuting and I'm listening to Trip and I'm listening to the new man and I don't even remember exactly what, but I just, I, I do remember I sat up in bed one night and I said, babe, I'm going to start a podcast and I'm going to talk about me getting sober. And like, I think like it'll help me. And I think it could help some other people because no, nobody was doing that at that time. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and the reason I knew that is because I, I started listening to the new man and then I went, man, I wonder if there's any recovery podcast. That'd be awesome if I could listen to like a meeting while I'm driving. And and there was there was one AA podcast, which I think is still going till this day. They've been doing great work. And, but then and then there was Dr. Drew, and everybody knows Dr. Drew. He he was kind of he was doing um, you know, some work in that field and he would talk about it here or there. But but there wasn't any specific like normal dudes like you and I, like just Mm -hmm. talking about this stuff, you know, it was only in the rooms that this was happening. And so I said, I wonder if I can help bridge that gap and talk about my own recovery. I was really eager to share like my experience and what was happening. And so, man, I had this hodgepodge of like um, equipment in my garage from all the music days recording. And I like, I started looking at um, videos by Pat Flynn from smart passive income and I started listening to um, Entrepreneur on Fire with John Lee Dumas. And uh, I was just like, I was grinding out these like ideas. And I remember I have all these envelopes in this binder of all these notes. And I was just like a madman, dude. Like I didn't yeah. sleep. <laughs> it was like, th- you probably, yeah, you probably know. Because you know how much it is. You, you have a podcast that you launched not too long ago. So you know it's a lot of work. There's a lot of stuff to kind of line up. And there's a lot of guessing. And like, is this, you know, am I doing this the right way? And yeah. um you know, and, and at that time too, like there, there wasn't, I didn't have a Roadcaster Pro, you know, I had an old mixer, like with, a, um, I called it the locker room recorder. It was kind of fun, man. And I really actually admire and miss those days. It was really cool. But yeah, so, so long, long story short, I mean, that, that's kind of how it came to be. And I think I interviewed, I think the very first podcast, I did like a monologue podcast, which I yeah. still love doing till this day, um, just kind of sharing. And then I had my wife on, I had uh, Seth on, I had my buddy Chris on, who was the one who got in the accident and, and almost died. He was in a coma, man. From there, I just, I was just a madman. I just started like reaching out to people, like just blindly. Hey, can you, would you like to come on my podcast and share, you know, a little bit? And, um, 
over time, it just, it, I, you know, I really, and I think the most important thing for me, like, is that um, I really enjoyed doing this. When I, when I think back right now in this moment of that time, like how I felt, um, I felt alive again. Mm. I felt like I had something to be excited about and something to live for. And so, and not that I didn't feel like that with like my wife and my daughter, because I absolutely did too. Like, but they were separate. They were two separate things. Like sure. this was like, like the creative spirit that has always lived inside of me was like, it was dead and now it was coming to life again. And it was like, it was so exciting. And so I just started putting stuff out every week and um, I just taught myself, you know, along the way. And um, I asked a lot of questions to people and um, to kind of transition into how I started doing it for a living because I wasn't making any money doing it at that time. I had pitched. So I, I worked for um, a, a Fortune 250 company. And I saw at that time, like where the podcast space was heading. And I had this vision of like, man, this platform could be great in communications instead of the 8,000 emails that I get every single day that I don't read. <laughs> and so like, I'm like, man, what if a podcast could work inside like customer service? And, and so long story short, I put together this little animated video and like, I had been talking to my, to some people like in, um, in management about this idea I had, and they were super cool and supportive about it. And they got me in touch with the right person. And so they gave me time to pitch this idea to like our directors and in, you know, in this conference room and I went in and I pitched the idea and they really liked it. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll pilot this. And they bought some equipment. Um, and then man, it's just like, I went on a rotation for like a, a, for that job. And then it's just slowly grown. And like today we're actually just about to take the pod, that podcast, which is customer service, energy related, um, uh, you know, business, gas, electric. We're about to take that for the first time which was my original idea in 2015 when they were like, yeah, you're going to have to dial that back. We're just going to do in-house. We're about to take it to the public right now. So like our customer base will start to be able to listen to the podcast and um, you know, out outside now. So that's, yeah, it's kind of, kind of neat. And it's been a long time coming. So, and then during that time, still doing sober guy, continuing to grow, starting to do conferences and live shows at the Hollywood improv and Sandy in San Diego innovations in recovery and Nashville. And man, it was just a fun, it was a really fun time. I was starting to make a little bit of money. Um, and then COVID hit and I was just about to do for, I was sponsored by foundations recovery network at the time. And I had done at hotel del Coronado, the innovations in recovery conference. Um, and I was doing live podcasts from there for like the previous three years and they had just invited me to present on the main stage and like do um, I, I was getting paid for it. And um, I was going to be with a bunch of NFL alumni. It was just so cool, man. Talking yeah. about recovery and my, my whole family got to come down with me every year. And they stayed in this great hotel uh, while I worked. And then they sent me a check and then boom, COVID hits. And then they're like, yeah, we're shutting down the whole conference. Can you send the money back? We're not going to do it. Ain't. Oh, man, yeah, it was Ouch. such a bummer, dude. Like, uh -oh. the baseball season got canceled. My son's like, God, what a, yeah. what a uh -oh. time. But, um, yeah, but, I mean, even, you know, even with that, the ups and downs of everything. You know, I, yeah. Like I said at the beginning, my main focus about everything in the corporate podcast and in Sober Guy is to put out amazing content that really impacts people and serves people and helps people and – and have fun doing it. And so I always kind of come back to that. And there's been times, you know, little times here and there where I get a little tired and I, I question that some days, but overall, that's my goal. And I'll, I'll continue to do that until I, you know, until God says otherwise, I guess. You know? That's awesome. Yeah. 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 Thanks for letting me share that too. It's, it's been, it's been, I don't think I've shared that in, in quite a while, if ever, like all that together. So I appreciate you um, um, allowing me to do that on, on your, on your show. No, I'm glad you did, man. I can relate to so much too, especially how you said you started your podcast. You know, when I was early on, when I was struggling early on and trying to trying to stay sober, I was sober early, and I I heard stories of maybe celebrities or athletes that were sober. Mm -hmm. That that helped me. Like that helped me. I said, totally. man, more people should should hear these stories. And then, like you said, in the meetings, you know, you can go to a meeting and hear a miracle story every single time you go to a meeting. And yeah. it kind of dawned on me recently, you know, when I started this, I'm like, you know, more people than the 30 people in this room 
can probably benefit to hear this. You know, I think maybe yep. there's, there's something here. And then, you know, the driving force and what, you know, what you're doing too is, you know, and, and my, our mantras, if you will, are, are very similar. Like I just want to help one person today. I think I said that, yeah. you know, but if is to, ins- you know, inspire, to inspire one person that they don't have to live that way anymore, that they're not yeah. alone. And not only can they get sober, but they can completely change their life around, you know, and, you know, look at, totally. I'm, I'm looking at one right now. You know, you were, look yeah. at where you were, you know, in that truck struggling and, you know, oh man, yeah. Addicted, and now you're making a career out of it and you're a coach too, yeah. right? Jay? Yeah. I do get to work with, with, um, with quite a few um, different, different guys. And um, we have a sober community on the locals platform. Uh, it's a sober men's group. So I think, I don't know, last time I checked, I know there was five or 600 dudes in there from all over the place, you know, just, um, you know, and speaking of that, my buddy Jason in there, he just hit nine months sober today, as a matter of fact. So, so you got guys in there sharing, you know, celebrating yeah. their wins, connecting, you know, in all different parts. Um, I do a Monday meeting and I've kind of, I mean, the last couple of weeks have been a little rough with that, with baseball and stuff. And I'm noticing like evenings are tough sometimes with scheduling. It's the mornings where are probably like my best time. The kids are still sleeping. I'm up early. So I may have to move that meeting to a morning meeting, but I like to try to have something. You got community and then there's also a main connect point, a meeting, even if it's a monthly something, you know, yeah. but yeah, I, I love working with, working with dudes. I, I get to work with a lot of um, different, um, different guys that are in entertainment industry from musicians, um, comedy, media, anything in the entertainment industry, because you're, you're, you are around the schedule's different. You're around party atmospheres, bars, clubs, yeah. you know, going to shows, playing shows. And so I do really enjoy um talking with those guys about that kind of stuff and how they're kind of navigating that and um you know my my buddy static he's actually a new jersey guy i think he's in north carolina now um but we we just met through you know through recovery and stuff and um you know he's he's kind of has some great insight into that as well just being on the road and being a touring musician and like how do i stay sober during that like it's it's difficult you know yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love working with, with other guys and, and chatting and just even just having these conversations, man, they're so therapeutic and so helpful for, for us, you know, just as two dudes rapping, Absolutely. but like, it's so cool that we get to send this out into the world and hopefully someone else hears it, you know, <laughs> that, and relates to it. Absolutely. I know someone is, I, I related to you all from, mm. from the get go. And so where can we find you? It's www.thatsoberguy.com, right? And you're on Instagram? Yep. Yeah, thatsoberguy.com. And then at that sober guy podcast on Instagram. Everything's on the website. You, the 30 day quit drinking dude challenge is on there. The sober guy men's group is on there. There's tons of podcasts, there's resources on there. So um, pretty much either 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 one of those, uh, Instagram at that sober guy podcast or the website that soberguy.com. And thanks so much, man, for for having me on today, Gary. I, I really appreciate it. No, thanks for coming. It's been a pleasure to, to talk to you. A pleasure to get to know you. Go find him, www.thatsoberguy.com. Shane, it's been a pleasure to having you on, and I'm really, really impressed with the work you're doing, man. Thank you. Thank you, man. And congrats on your podcast, and keep up the great work, man. I'm excited to uh, to watch it grow. I appreciate it. You, uh, you and I yeah. are going to stay in touch for sure, bud. Yeah, right on. Thanks again. Take care, bud. Thank you for tuning in to another powerful episode of the Begin Again podcast. We sincerely appreciate your time and support. We hope that today's conversation has ignited a spark within you, affirming that recovery is not only attainable, but can also be a wellspring of strength and resilience. Our ultimate goal is to make a difference in someone's life every single day. By sharing these stories of redemption, we strive to empower you and inspire you to unlock your fullest potential, facilitate positive transformations, and contribute to creating a better future for yourself, for your loved ones, and the world at large. If you know someone who can benefit from listening to our show, please share it with them. And if you resonate with our mission and feel compelled to do so, we would greatly appreciate your support through a five-star review following us on Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, The Begin Again Podcast. The more positive reviews we receive and the wider our message spreads, the greater our collective ability to help others realize that change is possible in their own lives. 
Thank you once again for being a part of our community. May you be blessed on your own journey of personal growth and transformation.